Okay, well, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to day two of the Students and Youth Professional Symposium presented by Desjardins. Uh, my name is Irina Nedeva. I am the JS Technician of the Road Safety Division at the City of Montreal. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the projects we have going on. Uh, after I'm done, I'm going to pass the mic to Bismarck Navarro, who will take you to two very interesting locations in Montreal in terms of road safety. So uh, the presentation will be twofold, and we will take the que questions at the end. So uh, first, before we, we dive in, I'm going to show you, take you through the, the outline of the presentation. So just a second here. So I'm going to start by touching down on the Vision Zero approach and its adoption at the City of Montreal. I'll give you a brief context, uh, as not as not everybody is necessarily familiar with the work that we do. I'll briefly talk about our annual publication of the Road Safety Report. Uh, after that, I'll talk to you about the EPCM, which is a team we send out on the field, and then I'll talk about the Road Safety Interactive Map, which is the virtual part of our presentation and let uh, Bismarck take it on after that. So what is Vision Zero? Vision Zero is, as the name says, a vision in which there are no road fatalities or severely injury, severe injuries happening. Now that Vision Zero core uh, is the acknowledgments that humans are not perfect and that they make mistakes, of course, and therefore their environment should be flexible and forgiving enough to avoid serious injuries and tragedies in cases of error. Now, oops, sorry, need to change that. There we go. Um, now, for this to happen, we need a systematic approach. And uh, as you may know, in uh, various factors come into play when it, we talk about road safety. Now, in this illustration, uh, a few of those factors are represented with Swiss cheese pieces, and each piece has different weaknesses, with, which are represented by the holes. Now, when those align fatalities occur. And the systematic approach uh, allows to study all those factors together in the system in order to limit those alignments and therefore to mitigate the consequences. Now, when did Montreal adhere to Vision Zero? Well, Vision, uh, Montreal uh, got on the boat in 2016. Now, prior to that, it's not to say that Montreal is not doing anything. Montreal is very concerned anyway. But uh, the interventions and the involvement was fairly limited in cases of fatal collisions, uh, which were very mediatized, or in case a coroner's report contains some specific mentions or recommendations to the city. Now, in 2016, Montreal adopted Vision Zero, and uh, following that, created a, a road safety division team, of which I'm part, and we are a team of 15 people. Now, also following the, the creation of the division, uh, we came up and wrote and, and established a Vision Zero plan of which the annual report, the EPCM, the interactive map are uh, important elements. And those are the things I'm gonna to talk to you about right now. Now, let's start with our annual safety report. Uh, as the name says it, it's a report we publish on an annual base. Our, our first edition is 2019, and it is currently available on our website. Uh, we are working at a 2020 release for this fall. You will understand that the pandemic did put us a bit behind, but we're working very hard to have it ready. Now, what's important and interesting in this report is that it contains a summary of all the different projects and works that we have going on. Uh, the first part is beyond just the plan of Vision Zero, of course, is the collision stats where we detail the different users we have uh, regarding uh, collision scenarios, the locations where these occur, uh, if we have more pedestrian fatalities or cyclists, if there's a age group that is represented, overrepresented, for example, like elders. Uh, there's also work summary regarding the community, uh, the committees and the work groups that we have. We are currently hosting at least six groups where we team up with our different partners like SAQ, uh, the ministry, the SDM, and work on various topics and concerns of road safety. Uh, the report also includes a summary on the EPCM work, as well as a summary and a portrait and update of the safety measures taken by the different boroughs of Montreal uh, that we query on an annual basis. 
Now, let's move on to the EPCM. What is the EPCM? Well, that stands for uh, Equipe d'Analyse Post-Collision Mortel in French, and that roughly translates into Fatal Collision Infrastructure Assessment Team. Uh, now, this is a group of specialists, usually composed of one or two people from our division, uh, a road engineer, somebody from the borough where the collision occurred, and usually one or two additional specialists. So those additional specialists might vary. For example, if the fatal collision occurred at an intersection with a street light, we will, we will usually call um, a light engineer on the spot to, so they are also able to assess the equipment. Now, the goal of the team uh, is to visit every fatal collision site uh, to understand as much as possible the environment and the context in which the collision occurred uh, the team observes and they assess the safety of the site. And when it's necessary, they will make recommendations and identify elements to be improved. Now, however, as we've seen with the Swiss cheese, there are a lot of factors at play and a unique reason for mishap can rarely be identified. So even if they're highlighted elements by the team, sometimes they may or may not have played a role in the collision. And that underlines the necessity of us working on a systematic approach. Now I'll just give you a quick look of some of the implementations that you can see um, following the team's visit on the field. So in the green uh, square, you'll see that um, on the left side at that location, the team recommended the installation of a pedestrian light. On the right side, it's more of a cyclist site, a light, sorry. Uh, in the blue square, you can see that the recommendation was to add a, a bench. And the cause for that is pedestrians were, were crossing prior to the intersection, which led to more conflicts with other road users. And by simply adding a bench, uh, it focused the pedestrians to crossing in the appropriate corridors and therefore decreased those conflicts. And lastly, uh, in the red square, you see that, for example, that recommendation at those sites was marking in the upper picture. You can see it's more regarding a lane definition circulation, and in the bottom one, it's to highlight the pedestrian cross. Now we're gonna go on to my favorite part, which is the interactive map. Uh, before we jump into the your interactive map, just wanna say that this is a very new platform for us. It was released last winter in 2021. Uh, so if you see any glitches, be we are well aware of them. This is our first version, so they will be addressed over time. Also, currently the portal is publicly available through the link below, but you should also, and it is in French, but an English translation should, have, should be available on the portal of this event on the CARPS website. And if you actually do a Google research, you should be able to find this, uh, this uh, interface as well. So now let's get on, get on with it. So first, I'm going to talk to you about the collision tab. Uh, on this uh, map, you will see the collision uh, collisions with fatalities and seriously injured users. Um, the reason this is the main focus for us in terms of Vision Zero, and also uh, the, the other fact is that Montreal has about 20,000 uh, collisions on a yearly basis, and luckily, all of, most of them are uh, material damage, but it would make for a very busy map if we were to plot all of that information on a single map. Now I'll draw your attention to the left side of the of the dashboard where you will have uh, the different filters you can apply to this data. So you see that you have a year filter well, where you have all the collisions from 2014 to 2019. Uh, it is our goal and we're working very hard to put 2020 out there this fall. Also you have following that the severity of the injury so you have the fatal cases mortel and then the seriously injured and you also have a filter by a user pedestrian cyclist passenger and of course by the borough because montreal is composed of 19 boroughs on the right hand side you have the summing up of the collisions based by the user and at the bottom you have a uh, separation of the use fatalities in gray and the serious injured in green so for example if you would be interested in seeing what are the fatalities that occurred in the last few years? You would simply click on Mortel and you will see you end up with only the black dots. And luckily, you end up with only 150 out of the initial 1,200 collisions we had here. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are pedestrians. 
uh, followed by passengers and then cyclists. And if you look at the trend of fatalities, you see that there seems to be a slight decrease. So for example, if we want to do the same thing, but with serious injuries, we'll just select Blessé Grave. And you see we end up with a lot more dots, the green ones this time, obviously 1100. Once again, the more touched kind of user is, more concerned user is the pedestrian, once again, followed by the passenger and the cyclist. And in this case, luckily, there is a, a fair decrease over the years. Now for the second tab, I'm just gonna pivot back to the presentation because it is a clear illustration here. Now, what you can see on this tab is basically the nine dominant scenarios we have identified in case of um, collisions with fatalities and seriously injured users. Uh, we have, that's a total of these nine most recurrent scenarios. You have three with pedestrians, three with cyclists, two with cars. Now, of course, if you do some of those uh, red percentages, that's not gonna give you a 100% uh, sum but it is because our focus is mainly to work on the very serious collisions first. And we will address obviously the other scenarios as we progress in our work. Now, also, if you want more details uh, about these scenarios, you can consult the report at the bottom, uh, sorry, the 2019 release, which is available on the website. And this tab basically allows you to navigate through all of those uh, scenarios. Now I'm gonna go back for the last section of the map, where we will be looking um, at the road safety measures implemented by the boroughs of Montreal until the end of 2019. So give it just a second, there we go. Uh, you can see here that it's very busy. We've received a lot of data. Uh, so this is all everything they've done until the end of 2019, 2020, hopefully will be up there this fall. And now with all the information we gathered from them, uh, we have created four categories that are illustrated here on the left side of the board. So once again, we have pedestrian crossing filters with different measures in that category. We have cyclist movements, we have speed management, and then we have traffic management. So I'm going to take you through a few of those. So just here you find the same layers, the same categories in the layers. And let's say we just want to focus on the pedestrian crossing, which is the first one. We're just going to check the other ones to make it a bit less busy. And we are going to focus on a borough called Saint Laurent, if the map is going to zoom there. And on this middle icon here, you can see all the measures within that category. So for example, you see that Saint Laurent has a lot of green dots here, which stand for pedestrian refuges. Now, uh, that place, uh, this boulevard, it's a Côte Vertu Boulevard, uh, has three lanes in each direction for vehicles. So that makes it quite a long crossing for any kind of pedestrian being elderly or not. And therefore it makes a lot of sense for them to have uh, that implementation at that very specific location. If we're more interested, let's say for uh, cyclist measures, and in this case, we navigate to the cyclist layer and we, let's say, go to Ville-Marie, a more central borough. Now you can see, we'll zoom in, this blue line, dotted line, which once again here, the different measures of that category, uh, the blue dotted line talks about, uh, is basically the uh, implementation by the borough of a concrete separation between the cyclist lane and the vehicle lane. With that in place, they contribute to the safety of everybody and uh, on the very busy and long axis. Now, finally, we can have a quick look at speed management measures. And in this case, we are going to go to the Bureau of Implement. Go back to the measures once again. And the pink dotted lines in this case represent uh, speed bumps. And you can see that in the Bureau of Outremont, uh, speed bumps have been put at all these uh, pink lines. Now, so you see that there's a lot of very interesting data on this map. Um, and uh, we we strongly value and try strive a lot to create a very full database that we will be able to analyze. Uh, but I just want to, as every database and map, we have limitations. So the map is only as good as the reported measures. 
Um, some of the challenge that we have is that not all the measures are located when we receive them. We receive some descriptions. And in order for us to be able to create the, uh, a full database, we have to uh, identify geolocalize them with X, Y, which can be very time consuming. Another challenge is that not all measures are reported in the survey. Now you can see on the picture on the right, uh, this is an inter this intersection that has seen a lot of modifications. You see that there's a vegetated curb expansion at every corner, uh, very uh, fitting information for our database, but unfortunately we did not receive that. So by doing the survey on an annual basis, it is our goal to create a very, um, uh, a full inventory, if you will, of the interventions on the, on, on the streets of Montreal. And our goal, of course, is to take that in parallel with the collision data and the observation of the APCM team. And uh, in order to implement the systematic approach where we'll be able to hopefully reach our vision zero targets of no fatalities and seriously injured on the road. Now that's it for me. I'm gonna pass it on to my uh, colleague here, Bismarck, who's gonna take you to two locations of interest. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Indira, for the introduction. As you saw, uh, even though the city has is new in the part of Vision Zero, as Indira mentioned, it doesn't mean that City of Montreal hasn't been done inter interesting stuff to help to reduce accidents that we are going to see in a moment. The next one, Indira, please. <clears throat> next slide. Okay, for example, here we have one of the, our it's, it's a very popular intersection that is close to downtown. Uh, as we can see in the picture of the right, basically that line that is uh, is, is dividing, divides somehow downtown and then some other neighborhoods of the city. If we can see it now in the picture that we have in the left, that basically that's the view of the intersection in the 1950s. But then in the 1962, there were some modifications to the intersection because you know it was the boom of the vehicles, development, et cetera. And then, next slide, please, India. Uh, and then, basically, here is what the city proposed or what they, what they built. I mean, if we remember, even though the flat view that we had at the, in, in before, it was just everything flat because we're just going, basically, just in, in, in horizontal view. Well, we have development, right? So we, the city came up with this proposal, which for pedestrians in mind was not that useful. Next one, please. As we can see here in this picture, this was, these are some of the views for pedestrians back in those days. The pedestrians, the, the pedestrian, they need to walk around, and we don't speak about cyclists because it's the same, and find basically their path to the destination. So if you were new kind of in the area and you were not knowing very well where to walk, you might get lost a bit from time to time. I mean, and this is the view basically in the summer. Can you mind in winter time when also the slopes are slippery? How dangerous it was for pedestrian? I was basically reading some, um, uh, people they were commenting it was very confusing and dangerous sometimes. So then, next uh, one in there, basically the city volleyed back and they designed a new intersection in early 2000s and they were everything flat now so everything was visible for cyclists, pedestrians and vehicles. And we can see even in the in the picture on the right, we have a bike path. Now they added the bike path also, we have we have a lot of uh, 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 cross walks. So now is everything is easier to navigate. Next one, please. So basically what happened here, I just want to point back this slide again. If we see the city roll it back and destroy a period of million of dollars, just because it was not convenient for basically safety and comfort of pedestrians and cyclists. And for vehicles, probably it was fine. They will continue having the interchange, but not for pedestrians. So they roll it back. They destroyed that million of dollars infrastructure. They built another one that they need to implement a bit more money just to go for basically to be somehow what is a vision zero approach now even though before the site the, the, city, the city decided to join this next one so this is i wanted to show that one as a big uh, uh, project of infrastructure that it was mostly focused on pedestrians now this one will never mess on if uh, if we remember you will recall very quick in one of the slides of in um was shown uh, from the from downtown montreal we had like pointing a point in line that it was basically a bike path, is this bike path. So basically what the city did, they decided to implement, to remove a car, a, a line of cars, which mostly for, uh, for parking and establish a two direction bike path that crossed all downtown 
And so in this case, it's bringing people from the east and from the west to the city. This, the length of this boulevard is 11 kilometers with a maximum ridership in uh, 4,300 uh, users per day. Well, you just need to remember like in Montreal, we have a peak in the summer and just go lower in the winter because of conditions. Uh, you know, we have normally four or five months of uh, cold. Something interesting here, like the ridership between 2015 and 2019, it was increasing a lot. Like 31% more cyclists were using, the, they were using this, uh, this bike path. I mean, 20, 2019, 2020, it decreases 21%, but COVID, you know, everybody stay at home now. Next one. So these are just some examples, of basically what, how it was before and how it ended after the treatment. This, uh, this example here is, a, is close to a metro station that is in the east part of the city. As we can see the picture on the left, it, it was how it was before, just, you know, kind of, I would say even, even a boring view. And now in the right of the left, we have the bike path divided, even with the, the pedestrians, it helps them also because if they want to cross even intersection that we can see just what is the arrow on the metro, uh, the blue arrow that we can see there, uh, it's even the, the, the exposed area for pedestrians is closer. I mean, they have even the bike path, they close, they cross that one and then they have the other part cross only for the street. Next one. And here we have another, close to another metro station, but now in the west part of the city. Uh, we can see in the left in the left picture, basically what happened, the cyclists, they, they have an indirect, uh, unidirectional bike path, one in going to that direction and the other in that direction, following the direction of the cars. Uh, but it was causing a lot of accidents. Even though there was infrastructure there, there were a lot of accidents, especially for a following intersection that is after that one. So the city, they put their people, basically they sit, they sat and they, they came up just to extend the two directional bike path. Now they have all the cyclists in one, in one side of the road and the vehicles in the other side of the road. As you can see here again, I mean, we have basically, they removed completely the, the parking lane now again in the other side and now we have the bike path in that area. Next one, please. And these are not just other examples like what happened after the, even in some areas, it just, we're going more to the west and we're, more, we're going more to the east Lower number of lower number of cyclists at ridership, but still the city try to protect them. Maybe we don't they don't build the concrete bollards, the concrete median, but they are adding bollards, which also they are pointed in the map uh, that it was shown before. You can see the bollards, but basically are these ones. They had infrastructure, and then in the wind, and then in the summer just just protect them so the, the cyclists they can continue riding safely. And even we can see in the one in the in the picture in the in the in the right the east side of the city, they had even some buffer in, in that area. But not just this one, as uh, as it was mentioned before, the the city also in this, especially in this boulevard, is, is installing some uh, traffic lights for cyclists just to give them more the time just for them. Okay. Uh, and then I just wanted to bring this, uh, this, this boulevard, even though it's not the busiest one in Montreal, I think it's very interesting to see because basically they move one parking lane and they first completed the city, like completely downtown. So it was interesting for you to see. Next one. Next, one. and then with that part, we will finish our presentation here. And uh, now we will open the the microphone for any the, the mic for any questions that you might have. Okay, uh, Irina, there's a question for you here. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Uh, so uh, can you get, get a bit more details on the question? I'm not sure I'm understanding what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. We need to open the microphone to Bruce, to Bryce Cumi. So let me see. Let me find him. Bryce, could you put a, could you write us a bit, a few more details as to what you mean by that? By associative me measures. Maybe like, yeah, he raised his hand, but then so we cannot make him speak. Yeah, sorry, but I, I think we cannot, uh, I mean, at least we don't know how to, to provide you, how to open you the mic. Uh, I mean, you can elaborate more in your question. Yeah, because. Uh... Ah, I see. Yes. Uh, so for now, okay, so um, the measures that we have currently, like they basically regroup everything that was done until the end of 2019. Uh, for now, we don't have a filter per year. So Hi, Alex. Getting. 
And no uh, problem. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and anyway, uh, so yes, so we are gathering the data, but you have to understand that uh, we don't, not everybody's able to give us a lot of detail on their implementation. Some have very detailed uh, information. They have the year, they have the materials, they have the exact locations. Sometimes we just get a map or sometimes we just get information and we don't necessarily have a year. So for now, we don't necessarily have a yearly uh, separation for them. We are working toward that as much as we can because 2019 was the first baseline here technically, but going forward, we will try to implement it as much as possible as yearly interventions for the, well, the yearly measures. So that, that would be it. But it is quite a big project. <laughs> it's a fun and challenging one. Okay, perfect. Um, Any other then... questions? Um, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Let, let me read. Um, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna read that one. Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna grab the one about the EPCM and then I'm gonna go back to you, Gail. Okay. Um so for the we do work with the SPVM because they, they are the ones who provide us with the actual collision data. Uh, and there is usually a meeting following up uh, the visits. So uh, they're not necessarily present on the field, but what happens is that when there's an accident, police is called in the location, there is a file that's filled out. And those files go uh, to the ACQ, those are filled by hand, and eventually we get that data back. And the, before, prior to every fatal collision visit, uh, there is a meeting between an agent of the SPVM and uh, the member in our division, which is in charge. So there is an exchange of information with them, with their team, and usually with a few other partners which are involved in this process of assessment. Uh, for Gael. Related to the one of Gael, I think that one I can reply to that one. Uh, in that one, it was found in a research that was made in 2014. There is a paper available. In, in fact, they used that Boulevard de Maisonneuve as, uh, as an example to do it. And it, they found it that there was a minor view for survivors when they were turning to the left, basically to cross the bike, the, the bike lane. But for that part, the city, fortunately, they, they have a study issue. That's why then the city, they decided to open a new project. Then when they were the one that they investigate those conflicts specifically. And now what they did is they installed those traffic lights. They have the traffic light for cyclists. What they try to do now is to stop cyclists. Let's say here in Montreal, what we have a kind of special type of traffic lights. Now, because they can go through, but the one they want to turn to the left, let's say in this case to the bike path, they cannot do that. They need to wait basically a couple of seconds while cyclists, they, they, clean, they clear the line and then they stop them. So this, I, mean, they, I would say this, they, is there's a proper signalization to avoid conflicts from that. And honestly, at least since I saw that the city implemented them, I haven't seen in the news any accidents, at least in this type of, in this type of infrastructure. So I guess it was very, it was, it was a success, I would say, in that case. Thank you, Bismarck. So I think there's no more questions now, and I think we're running out, but we're coming at the end of our time. So I just want to thank you all for attending, and please check out our network event tomorrow with the youth event again at the same time. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the, the, the conference. Just wanted to let you know, I just thought of something. So if some of you are following this gamification uh, game, your code for this conference is you, all in capitals, Y-O-U-T-H. Once again, thank you for attending, guys. And I want to thank, thank Irina and Bismarck for the great presentations. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Pleasure.